All right, ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Shall we? First, quick note, the Lexio Divina for tonight was perfect because it's a quick reminder how chronologically, in the order of St. Paul's letters, and really the end of uh, the letter to the Philippians, so about as chronologically close as you can get, St. Paul was telling, I'll just read it one more time for you, telling the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let all men know your forbearance. I mean, that, that's, that's got to strike you right off the bat, right? Joy, and yet we've got to be patiently suffering, forbearance. I mean, you don't forbear something that's nice and pleasant and just lovely, wonderful, no pain. Right? Let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything. And it, it's got to strike you again, right? Why is he talking about joy and then no anxiety? What joy brings anxiety, you know? I mean, it seems a bit odd. And, of course, it just increases, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, again, no need to promise peace if everything's just hunky-dory, everything's fine and dandy, right? Uh, so we're going to and we're going to see how the letter to the Colossians it's incredible. It's like St. Paul is is seeing that there's some confusion among those to whom he writes and is just filling in some blanks that remain among the faithful. Hopefully, by the way, uh, among other things, hopefully this helps you to sympathize a little bit with the medieval church uh, well before let's say the printing press and other cheap means of uh, uh, passing on reading materials, uh, the reason why the church was a little bit concerned about how, when, and by whom, and with under what you know, circumstances, what translation even, lay folks could read the Bible in the Middle Ages. All right, I mean, there, it's a really deep subject. There's lots to be said about it, but the one verse that we're going to spend the most time on tonight, I think, is going to strike you as so incomprehensible to the a just the average, even well-read Catholic. Right off the bat, you have to think about it a lot and compare and contrast other verses in Scripture that you're going to be able to at least understand why the church said, all right, uh, we want you to be fed on Scripture, but we want to make sure that the Scripture is also at the same time well explained by a capable person who, who knows the Scriptures well, all of the Scriptures, the whole, you know, from Old Testament to New Testament and is in a proper translation that really explains the concept of these Greek words that's it's not our language, it's not our mother tongue, right? And this is what the medieval church was dealing with. So again, that, I think we'll, we'll see some things tonight together that um, will re-emphasize that point for you. Another thing, just right off the bat, since I did tell you that we're going to be talking about slavery tonight, uh, is to note that slavery in the ancient world is... We're, we're not talking about 1850s America slavery. We're not talking about the sort of slavery that really, in certain parts, uh, thanks be to God, ever and ever um, fewer parts of Africa, but has lived on in the continent of Africa until the last few decades, right? I mean, more Africans have enslaved fellow Africans than any other people had. Uh, so we're not talking about that sort of truly chattel slavery when we're talking about Roman and even Greek slavery. What we're talking about is uh, a, a much broader concept where just to give you an example, a common example, actually, in the Roman Empire. If you or one of your family members got yourself into some very serious debt, think especially, I tell you what, let's, let's do it this way. Think if you're a gentleman, okay, and you're doing okay financially, but let's say your sister marries someone, he gets himself some bad business deals, maybe he gets sick, can't work, or has to try to pay for you know, some ancient medicines that are going to cost him a bit in ancient Rome. It gets himself in a lot of debt, and let's say your, your, your dear sister has some children as well, and all of a sudden there are a ton of outstanding debts, and your brother-in-law dies. Now what's going to happen? Very often what will happen in the ancient world is your sister is going to be sold into a sort of slavery, together with especially any potentially female uh, nieces you may have, all right, some nieces, and then your nep nephews could as well be sent out to work. And I don't think I have to say much to get the point across. You know what sort of slavery I'm talking about. It's horrible, all right? That existed in the ancient world. It's just a reality. And so what uh, a man could do is say, well, I will, I will take the place there. I will work for you as long as you need to just to pay off the debts, but, you know, 
pass the debt on to me or I will give you just about everything I have. I'll sell off my property or much of it to pay off the state. You see what I mean? I mean, it was basically indentured servitude to a great extent, but they, they called it slavery. The word was still slavery. So the, the term's a little bit broader than what we're accustomed to from more modern history, late modern history. Just, just a little historical reminder there about different culture. All right. Um, another thing, one off the bat to note is that the the terminology in the letter to the Colossians is going to resemble that in the letter to the Philipp, uh, to Philemon rather, and that's for two reasons. All right. One is that the, this concept of slavery and freedom has been on St. Paul's mind since the letter to the Galatians, right? Remember that? We're talking about Hagar and Sarah and the comparison there between slavery and freedom in Christ since chapter 4 of Galatians. So that's one thing. However, in the, uh, let, let's say, more specific context of the Christian community there in Colossae, they, uh, Philemon lives there, okay? Philemon is a Colossian himself, all right? And not only that, the uh, man who was formerly his slave, Onesimus, whom we're going to read about in the letter to Philemon, is the one carrying both these letters to the Christian community there in Colossae and to Philemon, his former owner, as well. All right? The former slave, runaway, fugitive slave, who it's, it's clear from the, the context of Philemon, uh, took some, uh, let's say, worthy stuff from his, his owner, took something that was worth a lot. So probably lived like the prodigal son for a while before he gets caught up in something not legal in Rome and gets jailed for it. Uh, he's one of the two people, at least, bringing these letters back to the place where he used to live and to his former owner. All right. So that's why the, the vocab is going to overlap a lot, Colossians and Philemon. You're going you're to wonder, why is St. Paul for four chapters using all this terminology that has a lot to do about sla with slavery? You know, that, that's part of the reason. But the other part is that it's a theological concept that helps us understand the way we were bound to, not just the Old Covenant, but, as your outline is going to reemphasize, again, for probably the third or fourth time, our, our servitude outside of Christ to slavery, or excuse me, our slavery to Satan, sin, and death. So it's a theological concept we've got to understand. And our freedom to live for God now, to live for a master who loves us, a, a father, actually, which is going to be the language Paul is going to reiterate in Philemon. The other, uh, let's say, hmm, I don't want to put this, the other concept that's going to be in St. Paul's mind throughout the letter of the Colossians is knowledge, understanding, wisdom, Think of any other synonyms you want to in that same sort of genre. Uh, you might ask yourself, why? Well, I wrote the word up here, and it's you know a, a word that you may not have heard of, or you may have heard it in various contexts and forgotten the, the import of it, Gnosticism, okay? Which is very, very hard to define in the ancient world because there were so many instantiations of it, so many different instances where Gnosticism is a problem for the early Christian community. So what I'll just do is recommend... Sometime after this class, next week or so, just look up in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Look, look up in Wikipedia for, for really all, all that matters. Find out some stuff about Gnosticism. This is a uh, probably the most serious uh, difficulty for early Christianity outside of the, the, the Jewish, Jew Gentile debate in the early church is Gnosticism. And one of the most famous saints in the early church history, St. Irenaeus, has to deal with this problem a lot. He writes a whole set of books on it against the heresies. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but it's, it's a bit confusing, it's a bit tricky, but just to, to get the word out there, I already, already let you hear it one time, I think will help. All right, so that's the thing. Knowledge, how to understand more, and then this, this slavery versus freedom. But just a quick reminder about why theologically, why is knowledge of something so important? Well, uh, this is the way St. Thomas Aquinas talks about it, and, and this is the way St. Paul is going to talk about it in the letter to the Colossians. All right? Before we can do something uh, that with uh, full intention, with the, with the right intention, before we can act on something, first of all, we've got we to gotta will that thing. We, we have to say, even if it's you know, shorter than a second or, or a cent, we have to say, yes, I, I choose to do this. To say it's an action for which we're either culpable or for which we can gather praise or merit from God. 
But we can't make a choice about whether we want to do something or say, no, I don't want to do that unless we know it first. So knowledge, making a choice with our free wills, and then actually doing it. Okay? And if you think about it, that might remind you of something you, from the old Baltimore Catechism, your old early catechism, right? The requirements for saying, all right, this was a mortal sin that I committed. You have to actually do the thing, you have to go through with it. You have to have, you know, freely chosen it. I mean, no one was either metaphorically or literally putting a gun to your head. And you had to know that it was wrong. Doesn't mean, by the way, if the first two aren't there, if you don't willingly choose it or if you don't know that it's wrong, doesn't mean that bad consequences still won't come for it, even, you know, come after it, even if it's, it's not a mortal sin for you. But it does just mean that, you know, you couldn't be imputed as a mortal sin in your soul. Anyway, just to let you know, knowledge has to be the beginning for pretty much everything in the spiritual life. Okay? That's why God, through sacred scripture, chooses to reveal himself. To me. The, the, the normal definition for revelation is God making himself known and his plans known to mankind. He's giving us some knowledge. All right? Okay, so that's just some general stuff. Uh, one thing I'd point out to you as well about the letter to Colossians, it's so important, is that he's going to give us a few instances of what he introduced in the letter to the, to the Galatians. Do you remember in chapter 4 when he's talking about, again, Hagar and Sarah, uh, he said these things were an allegory. Remember that? Chapter 4, early verses, you know, 4 through 6, chapter 4. Well, if you look in the middle of page 143, there's a little quote there from Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, in which it's talking about baptism, which is a, quote-unquote, hands. You see that? What St. Paul's doing there is he's giving you an instance of the allegories in the Old Testament. That is, re realities, things that happened in the Old Testament, but that were definitely, th their, their aim, their end, their goal was just to point to a greater reality and a much more spiritual reality than the, the physical representation that you have in the Old Testament. It's pointing to something greater. It's a sign of something that is to come. And so part of this allegory. So St. Paul's going to give us a few examples in the letter to the Colossians to help us understand what he brought up a long, long time ago, one of his first letters there in that letter to the Galatians. So there's that to note on that first page, which explains a few interesting things there. And by the way, I also noted, noted for you here on the board, chapter 3, verse 16, and they, they tell you about it here in that same paragraph. Uh, so we're turned over and over, turned over again and again in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, so that it might dwell richly in their heart and overflow in a thanksgiving. So it's beautiful to talk about the one richness that Saint Paul and then after him Saint Jerome and all the other saints are going to say. Look, if you want to devour something, if you want to just gorge yourself on something in the Christian life, there's one thing you can do that with sacred scripture. Okay, so you get. Eat, go easy on the beer over there, but you can gorge yourself on sacred scripture, okay? So that's, that's neat to know that that's the one thing that we can have, um, have as much of as we want, never have a fill, okay? Uh, but not only that, I, I, I noticed something here that connects with a quote from uh, the Second Vatican Council. We're talking about psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh, Vatican II talks about a music, this is in the Constitution and the Liturgy, Sacrosancto Concilium, it talks about a sort of music that is proper to the Catholic Church. And you're probably thinking, what? You know, the Church has its own music? Yes, yes, and it's, um, I, I don't know, I hope you've heard it a, a lot recently, because it's like Vatican for all Catholics. And that is Gregorian chant. Okay? Not just because it's peaceful and kind of puts your heart at ease and you, you know, feel like you want to go into a sauna and just ah, breathe it in as you're listening to it, but because Gregorian chant does something, besides having been the, the medium for conveying the liturgical worship of the Catholic Church for at least the last 1,300 years, you know the other thing it does? With its music, it gives pride of place to the written Word of God. It is taking texts from sacred scripture and putting, putting it to music. So right here what St. Paul's talking about in Colossians 3, 16 and 17. But putting it into such a music that the music does not in the least distract you from the words that are there. Okay? So the primacy is given to the word of God. That's why Gregorian chant has always been, you know, as long as human history goes back and records it, till the time of St. Gregory the Great, has been the, the Catholic Church's music. 
say, here, let's, let's get this into you, and because it's musical, it's going to be easier to remember. All right? So that's, that, that was always the goal of Gregorian chant. And that's why St. Pius X, you know, um, pushed it so strongly and uh, apparently taught... I mean, this is incredible. If you go back and look at one of these big collections of Gregorian chant throughout the year, taught, as he was a parish priest, taught his entire congregation how to sing all the Gregorian chant that was in these old books of chant. It's a remarkable, remarkable feat. But um, and that was before he became bishop, just as a simple parish priest there in Italy. Okay, there's that. And then finally, at the very bottom there, page 143, uh, there's talk about Jesus' triumphal procession. The thing I'll note for you there is that um, we're talking about a war and what happened usually in antiquity. Another way you can get yourself into slavery is if you fight in a war, if you make the choice to fight in a war on a particular side and your side loses, you're either like the Jews here in Jerusalem in 70 AD, and your majority were, or you're put into slavery. Okay? So this is another thing to bear in mind. The examples that St. Paul's using in the letter to the Colossians bring up these examples that would have been um, easily recognized by Greeks, Romans, and Hebrews. What happens even in the Old Testament? If you lose in a battle, nine times out of ten in the Old Testament, you are put into slavery for the people to whom you just lost. You probably remember that from you know, year one last year. But you know, just quick reminders. Okay, we jump to the key themes. The first key theme is probably the most, well, title number two, uh, very, very important. So the pr supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus. So we, w because the outline uh, really hurries through that in a certain sense, let me just explain one thing. A historically, for the Catholic Church, a, a problem consistently has been dealing with uh, not just the lax members in the church. Okay, every religion has lax members. Uh, another difficulty for the Catholic Church, often trying to find that virtue that lies in the middle, is what do you do with uh, the overzealous who want to, not, not just zealous in and of themselves, but want to require more than what is actually required of everybody? What do you do with that? Now, believe it or not, the Catholic Church has had to deal with a lot of uh, instances of that. Uh, and part of the, the reason for that from the early days on is just this natural concern. That, really, is this all I have to do? I mean, when the young man asks our Lord, uh, what's, you know, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you all have probably heard the little statement that St. Augustine adds to that, right? You know, love God and then do what you will. If you're loving God, do what you will. Now, obviously, the church tells us how precisely to love God, so there's a little bit more to it than just that, but pretty good summary, all right? But it seems almost too good to be true, almost too simple. Another example I was given the other day was, um, think about a plenary indulgence, okay? You're telling me that I can say a, a little litany or any day, of, you know, a particular feast day, say a particular litany, but any day of the year, I can pray a rosary, just go to Holy Communion at Mass, have been to confession a week before or a week after, say a few prayers to the Holy Father and not have any attachment to a particular sin, and by that, that one act, all temporal punishment due to my sins, any sins, is remitted. Yes, that's what the Church tells us. And, and in fact, you, you can find these collections, the Reculta, that is a collection of different prayers. There are probably a hundred different things you could do every single day. I mean, you can only gain one plenary indulgence per day, but you've got different options the way you could do it as well. It almost sounds too easy, right? Does it not? I mean, come on. It, it's really, the church gives us a lot of ways to be saved and even to avoid purgatory, right? Apostolic benediction there at the end of your life, you know, making your confession and getting the last rites there. It's incredible. So, Catholics, um, throughout 2,000 years, you know, we're not, not the only ones who've just been a little nervous. That seems just, wow, that's a piece of cake. You know? Well, it's usually not quite as easy as you know, it seems from afar. But in any case, that in regard to the sufficiency of Jesus, right? Uh, the thing about supremacy, I, I think your outline will we'll talk about in specifics when we get there. So is, 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 just, um, is just Jesus enough? That's the sufficiency, but supremacy... God, it's what we talked about last week when the letter to Philippians, God took on human nature? Boy, that, that's a big kenosis. That's a big emptying, okay? We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to the specifics when we get to the, that part in the outline. 
Point two, suffering, its origin, transformation in Jesus, and contribution to the life of the church. I mean, the first one you've already studied enough about, I think, in, in year one, and already as we talked about in the letter of the Romans especially, that's not that big of a deal. Transformation in Jesus, we've gotten a lot of that, transforming our suffering in the letter of the Philippians, okay? But here, it's contribution to the life of the church. I think we're going to get a few new... Uh, yeah, just new, new bits and pieces to the story in the letter to the Colossians that are, that are worthwhile, that give us kind of an extra, I guess you'd say, enthusiasm to, to be able to understand <laughs> what St. Therese Lazio, what in the world she's talking about when she just says, you know, she sees suffering and she, she sees it, it's a crucifix, she just wants to hug and kiss and embrace. You think, what? Well, 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 we'll be able to understand it a little bit better after reading tonight's lesson, I think, and, and the particular verses in Colossians. Key thing number three, uh, we're going to get, again, I, I already, I think, alerted you to what happens in chapter two. But again, we're, we're filling in the blanks from what St. Paul suggested in Galatians, elucidated a little bit in the letter to the Romans. We're going to get a little bit more of that baptism, what it does, and the new life it demands. Just... Because it's so much. It's the, the gateway to all the other sacraments. So getting baptism right, that's a biggie. Okay? That's important. And then key thing number four is not just about the particular situation of Philemon, obviously, but this comparison between slavery and freedom in Christ has been on St. Paul's mind since he started writing letters. It, it's very lightly hinted at in the first two letters of the Thessalonians, the first ones we read, but it's especially clear in Galatians. I mean, that one, it just, it's everywhere. So we'll get to that when we read the letter of Philemon, but I'll, I'll also be bringing up some phrases in the letter to the Colossians, and you just think, it's like he's talking about slavery here. It, well, he is, and so we'll, we'll, we'll note that when we get to it, okay? Um, any questions about the key themes or anything I've said so far that's a little bit... Unclear? Okay. All right, let's jump right into it then. The introduction they give you uh, reminds you that St. Paul did not found this community. This Epaphras, who was at one time a bishop there, uh, and, and it seems like now is probably jailed in Rome together with St. Paul, or he's at least in Rome very often with St. Paul. He's the one that founded the community. However, uh, this doesn't seem to come up a lot in the outline. I, I was kind of surprised about that. It is worth noting, though, that St. Paul was well was very, very familiar with the, the Christian community there in Colossae. Okay? And he obviously knew Philemon, a very important layman in the community, extremely well. The, the casual tone and, and very, very familiar tone that he uses with him in the letter to Philemon makes it clear, I mean, St. Paul is comfortable writing to this guy and asking for such an incredible demand in the ancient world. So there, there's that to remember. St. Paul's not the founder, but he, he knows the folks there well. And uh, I can laugh with you once more that your outline is a little bit nervous about dates, so we're just we're going to give ourselves a two-year buffer on either side, 60 to 64, 62 AD, okay? I mean, if you had to ask me, I'd just give you one date, but there you go. Got a two-year buffer on either side, just play it safe during St. Paul's first Roman imprisonment still. Uh, number, point uh, C there, occasion for writing to assert the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus, yes, against relapse into either paganism or Judaism. The only thing I'd uh, clarify there for you, ladies and gentlemen, is that, and that's why I put up here syncretism, just to explain a little bit better. Uh, we're not talking about, fo it doesn't seem like St. Paul's concerned that the folks here in Colossae are going to say, all right, well, I'm done with Catholicism. I'm, I'm, I'm no longer calling myself a Christian. That's, that's not the issue. In fact, it has rarely been the issue. Complete apostasy uh, a few times, but, but relatively rarely in St. Paul's experience. It seems like they want to mix and match a little bit. Okay, Go back to some old bad habits that are contradictory to the gospel. Or want to believe things that are contradictory to the truths of the faith that has been passed down to them. Not just from St. Paul, but from Epaphras as well. And so that's why I just I gave you a, what I think is a little bit better word to describe this relapse. It's not a complete abandoning of the faith, but syncretism, which uh, is still with us, right? Wanting to basically mix something other than the, the Catholic Christian faith with the authentic and true faith. 
Yeah, I'll take a little bit of this, even when it's contradictory. So I'm not talking about enculturation, you know, uh, wearing particular garb that, that fits the local area or something like that. No, I'm talking about just moral practices that are repugnant to the gospel. Or, as the Colossians seem to believe, that the angels, it, you need to worship the angels in, in order to have a complete worship. Okay, we'll try to understand why that was even accepted at any point ever uh, in Christian history. And I, I think it's, it's understandable from a certain uh, viewpoint. So we want to try to understand it and sympathize with what's going on there. But it's clearly not in line with the truths of the faith. So we've got to get rid of it. So again, your outline gives you those two examples. False teachers taught the worship of angels who were regarded as equal or even superior to Jesus. And then the Judaizers made their, had made their way here. False teachers wanted the Colossians to observe the old law. And that is the example I was talking about with sufficiency. Just thinking, this whole Catholic thing is just too, it's almost too easy, right? It seems almost too easy. So you're going to add some stuff. Well, well, we'll address that difficulty as well. And again, what I want to try to help us do is, uh, it, it's easy to kind of laugh and ridicule at, how ridiculous some of these things are. But to understand why they would have accepted in the first place, we're going to try to put ourselves in their shoes and see that. So we'll see if we can do that well. Any questions before we jump into the actual letter itself? Okay. As happened um, a few times, I think twice in the past, your, um, your instructor is furious that the outline omits the first, you know, umpteen verses. So I'm going to add a few things that your outline does not have. This is for free. This is just because you came to seize on Thursday night. So this one is for free for you here. So I'm going to add some things from chap uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 12 that are not in your outline because it's too good to pass up, okay? So, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ at Colossae. To the saints. And, okay, that's, that's a peculiar word St. Paul's using. He's writing to saints. I mean, he's getting the courier to take an airplane and just head straight up? I mean, what, what's he talking about here? We'll, we'll, we'll see. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We'll see what why he wishes grace and peace. But we always thank God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love or charity which you have for all the saints. All right, saints. Who, who are these saints? Now, now it's getting to you, right? Twice he's mentioned these saints. The saints we're talking about right here are members of the church, and if we had to specify, doesn't seem like they're members of the church triumphant in heaven. Doesn't seem like they're members of the church suffering and purgatory. They're members of the church triumphant. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, militant rather, church militant on earth. So why are we calling them saints? These members of the church here on earth, church militant. Why do we call them saints? Well, yeah, that's it. They're, they're, they're fighting, you know, the, the reign of, of Satan and sin and trying to, yeah, de defeat them through Christ. But especially because they have the sacrament of baptism. They are holy. They are actually made holy by the sacrament of baptism. The, the reason I emphasize this is um, not to, to pick on Protestants, but uh, a key distinction between Catholic teaching and Protestant teaching is that we believe the sacraments actually effect, bring into effect, with an E, effect what they signify. They cause what they signify. So baptism, yeah, it just looks like a washing away of sin. But what, not just. It doesn't just look like it. It actually does that. That's what Catholics believe. Now, that's what we're commanded to believe, at least. All right? That baptism actually does that. So, in that moment when you receive baptism, when the, a little child receives baptism, I went to a baptism of a little three-day-year-old. The father planned the baptism. Moms, okay. My wife let me know, said, if you ever, you know, two days after I've given birth, I'm going to try to, you know, drag me into the church. Was, she, I was going to be throwing her wrath, so I was like, okay. All right. You know, like the old circumcision, eight, eight days is fine. All right, I'm, I'm okay with that. But uh, in any case, it's, just, it's beautiful to think about the truths of the Catholic faith. That little three-day-old baby w was just made a saint right in front of our eyes, right? If, God forbid, she had passed on, and that, no question about it, going straight to heaven. That's a saint. 
all original sin, not the effect, but all original sin wiped away, all actual sin for us adults who have been baptized in, um, as an adult, as I was. It's an incredible thing to think about. So there's that. Saints actually, through baptism, and as long as we hold on to the state of grace, we can still rightfully be called saints in the church militant. But then, if you work your way down a little bit, you get to, let's say... Let's look at verse 11, maybe. Okay, yeah, let's look at verse 11. May you be strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Again, made this happen. Not just it seems like it, it looks like it. it you know, has qualified us, actually, to share in the inheritance, this inheritance of the saints in light. Now here, we distinguish saints and say, these are the saints in heaven. Okay, the saints in light. At, at most, you might be able to extend it to the saints, uh, the, the, the church suffering in purgatory because they know they're saved. There's no way they can ever be damned. Those in purgatory know they're going to make it to heaven. They have that, that hope is confirmed. Okay, but it's, it seems to me it's pretty clear we're talking about here. Saints in light, we're talking about the church triumphant. The glorious church in heaven, those who have persevered and are up there together with the angels now and God. They're enjoying the presence, the immediate vision of God. Uh, contrary to what, there was actually a, a pope a long time ago, Pope John XXII, who um, uh, wrongly, for a, a, a few weeks in a row, said that those who died didn't see the immediate presence of God. And so some theologians came along and uh, corrected him and said, No, Your Holiness, uh, you, you're mistaken. Actually, the church teaches that. The, the saints who pass on and those who are in the state of grace and have no sin to um, atone for in purgatory, they actually see God immediately upon death. Immediately. And so eventually, thanks be to God, the, the Pope corrected that. He stopped preaching that in daily homilies and got that fixed. But in any case, it, so it's, it's something that's almost hard to believe. It's so great. All right? So there, there's that distinction in the word saints. What do we mean by saints? How can you tell me I'm a saint? according to one view of things you are by your baptism. You are indeed a saint. All right, there is that uh, in that first part. But another thing I wanted to show to you is that St. Saint, Saint Paul gives us an example of what I showed you right here. Knowledge will put into action. Look, look at verse 9. And so, from the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's all these synonyms about what's up here. Right? Intellectual, so understanding, wisdom, knowledge. Okay. What's the goal of that knowledge? To lead a life. Actually, the, the Greek word means to walk. That's that Old Testament you know, Hebrew idiom that you guys know well from last year. To walk with the Lord. To lead a life worthy of the Lord. Full, and, and not just that. Not just to walk according to the, the Lord's precepts, but fully pleasing to Him. That means that our, our intention in pleasing, in, in walking the right walk, in walking the, the, the Christian walk, makes a difference. The goal is not, like the Pharisees, to look nice and just in the eyes of men, but it's to please God. And our Lord reminds us of this, right? You can't please two masters ever. So, uh, to please God, that is, our, that is our sole goal, fully pleasing to Him. And then St. Paul leaves a tidbit that I didn't even write up here for you, but it's, it's a good thing to, to go with. On this earth, none of us can ever be content with whatever, you know, Never. So he says, uh, and bearing fruit in every good work. I mean, come on. The, the greatest professional athletes uh, always have to work on a little something, right? There's always something, some area in which they could improve. Um, I remember when I was a kid, just a you know, quick little anecdote. When I was a kid, Michael Jordan, he's just the greatest basketball player ever. But uh, the one thing that he worked on and improved, that, that little fadeaway shot that no one could block and... It, Ends up winning several championships after he gets this other move that just no one can stop. All right, so it, we can always, even the best, can always improve, not just physically, but spiritually throughout our lives. So in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So there, the, the sense is not just that we can learn more about the catechism or sacred scripture, but the word for knowledge here, epignosis, this gnos, uh, there is a sort of good Catholic Gnosticism. That is, uh, the same way we can always learn more about our spouse, you know? 
we're talking about that, that re relationship where we just sit there and have, have a, a conversation with God, I guess is the best way to put it, the way you would with your spouse, because you love them, okay? So this, um, this knowledge of God that we get through relationship, that w w that we, never, we never really have enough of that. We can always get some more. Okay, so I just thought that that's beautiful. That's worth having before we jump into the outline proper. Uh, but any questions about the that little extra bit that I gave you there? Okay, so that was just something to prepare us for what we're jumping into here. So Jesus and creation, the old and new creation. We're going to hear a Christological hymn. All right, and just look at what your outline shows you there. And, a, it says, Jesus' primacy in the realm of the old creation. He created and preserves all things, so therefore He is God. And Jesus' primacy in the new creation. Jesus as man is the head of a body, Catholic Church, and all grace has come from Him and through that body. But let's see what St. Paul writes to understand each phrase kind of bit by bit. Because again, I think your, your outline's correct. This is a hymn, so we'll, we'll take kind of each line of the hymn and understand, make sure we understand each line, okay? So in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God. That's, that's line one of the hymn. He's the image of the invisible God. Does that ring a bell from your one image? He is the image of the invisible God. Does that sound like... There we go. Genesis 1.28. Let us create man in our image and likeness. O you are our... Uh -huh. There's a plurality there. He is the image of the invisible God. All right, that image of something signifies we're talking about more than one person in the Blessed Trinity. All right? So the image of the invisible God, it's, and it's the very same word that's used in Genesis 1.28. So here we go. We're talking about the old creation here. Um, the firstborn of all creation. So showing his priority in time, you know, beforeness in time. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth. In him. Remember, in the beginning is the way Genesis starts, in the beginning. God created heavens and the earth. Seems like there's a New Testament book that begins that way. In the beginning was the Word. It's this one and the same person, I think. Yep. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth. And here, this is, this is just a warning to the Colossians. All things visible and invisible. It is true, yes, Christ became visible. And for the Hebrew mind, as well as for the Gentile mind, to a certain extent, especially these Gnostics we've been talking about, that's why I want you to look them up. It's really important to get this. Being visible is a, a big step down from being invisible. All right? In fact, the, most of the, the ancient Romans and Greeks would admit, yes, the gods that we worship were human beings at, some, at one point. Okay, now we, we have elevated them to a superior status because now you can't see them. Now they're invisible. They've gone up a notch. Okay, so invisible, and let's just say in general, and especially for the Hebrews, is recognized as above, superior to the visible. So the fact that this Jesus character was visible at some point seems, for most of St. Paul's readers, to be one strike against him at least. Okay, the fact that he's going to suffer and then die going to be kind of three strikes for some people's eyes. But in any case, just to get that out there, he also created things that are invisible and visible. And then St. Paul goes on to name some choirs of angels, whether thrones or, domination or dominions or principalities or authorities. All things were created through him. Okay, your, your average Jew and your average Gentile of Roman... Greek barbarian background could probably accept that first half of that little that last verse there. All things were created through him. Okay, well, he's the means by which the superior God created. Okay, I'll, I can grant that, I guess. And for him, that would be the sticking point. Okay, especially for uh, devout Jews who are reading the Old Testament and see that creation is for the Lord, for for God. You see. Wait a minute, this creation is for Jesus as well? That must mean He's God. That, that would be the logical deduction to make there. So for Him as well, not just through Him, but for Him. He is before all things, and in Him... I mean, the RSV is a decent translation, but here, this, this should be a little bit stronger. And in Him all things hold together. The sense of this, the, the Greek word here is... All right, so look, let me, let me, let me back up one step. There are three parts to creation, all right, or, or let's say to, to human existence even. You've got creation, get things started. You've got the distinction of creation, so you start doing the different things in the six days other than just heaven and earth. But then things don't stop 
with being after the sixth day. God can rest, but He has to preserve us in our existence. Scripture makes this clear over and over again in the Old Testament and here in the New Testament. So here, I, w I would say, in, in Him, all things uh, continue to exist. Subsist. Subsist. That's the word we're looking for. Subsist. That is, we don't get to continue being without God's contribution or, let's say, you know, His, his nod. Okay? We are allowed to continue in being thanks to God's love. So things begin with creation, but in Him all things continue to exist or subsist, continue to persist, I guess. In Him all things hold together. That's the old creation, okay? This Jesus whom we worship, He is the, the Creator God of the Old Testament that you've been reading in liturgy over and over and over again for the last few years since your conversion. And then we get to point B about the new creation. He is the head of the body, the church. All right? He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, which St. Paul is going to draw out and say, there are going to be others. He's the firstborn because there are going to be other brothers after him All right, who are going to uh, rise from the dead as well. Firstborn from the dead, that, so that, in everything, he might be preeminent. And why is that? Well, for in him, all the fullness, uh, in this man, one who is also man, the reason that he has to be preeminent is that in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So this is the thing that whether Jew or Gentile, I just, I, I, just I, I can't handle it now. Why would they say that? Because for the Jews, th there's only one God. And you're telling me that one God decided to take on human flesh, the human flesh that He created, and He's going to put it on as weak and as you know, beset by weakness and suffering as it is? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to say. The difficulty for the pagans or the, the Gentiles is a little bit different, right? As polytheists, to think that all divinity is in this one person. Polytheism for you then. All divinity in this one God, this single God. So it's going to be, let's say, displeasing to both Jew and Gentile in that regard. And verse 20 is probably the most incredible thing. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of His cross. Now, ladies and gentlemen, look, if you're, if you're like me, every once in a while you start reading Scripture and you know, you're getting a lot of good stuff out of it, but every once in a while you can kind of jump through a phrase that you've heard a thousand times, you know. I hope I'm not the only one that does this. Uh, so, you know, you read something that says heaven, heaven or earth, or on heaven or in earth, or excuse me, on earth or in heaven, rather, and you might go through that quickly. What I'm going to caution you about here is don't do that here. When it says that He reconciled to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. And then it says, And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, He has now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death, in order to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before Him. Here, I think St. Paul has in mind, that's the reason I wrote this up here, this little... A set of talks you could listen to. Father Chad Ripper, who's a priest of the Archdiocese of Denver, has some great talks on angels you can find easily on YouTube. Okay, great, great talks. He's an exorcist here in the Archdiocese of Denver and explains a lot about the angels for you. Okay, so the reason right there at the bottom left, Father Chad Ripper, uh, angels, just you know, type that in on YouTube, you find it in a heartbeat. The reason I want to uh, encourage you not just to look up a little bit about the Gnostics, but also a little bit more about the angels, because the angels come up so often in this letter, is to see what, what sort of enmity or what, what is it, or you know reconciliation is going to be necessary here, this estrangement, hostility. What sort of enmity or hostility is there between us and the folks who are in heaven besides God? Well, what I would suggest to you is that it's between us and the angels. Now you're thinking, all right, what's he mean? Well, don't forget, the way angels work, they're not like us. They don't sit on the fence, right? They don't, they're not gung-ho and enthusiastic about the faith one minute and then, you know, like I am after a confession, you know, you, you, as soon as you jump on I-25, I'm like, okay, guess I'm going to confession again tomorrow. Okay, they're, they're not like that. Okay, they're not much better than I am. So there's that. That is not how the angels are. The angels are um, the, the reason they're considered so perfect, and rightly so in a certain sense, the reason they're considered more perfect than, than human beings is that when they understand something holy and entire all at once.
simultaneously. They don't have to think and think and think and think and think about it. They don't have to reason through things. They understand immediately. Then, here's the kicker. They make an act of the will, and that is it for all eternity. So they chose in the beginning whether to follow Satan and say, I will not serve, or they said, I will serve, and I will do whatever God tells me to do. Once and for all. They don't, they don't ever go back. They don't ever second-guess themselves. They don't ever doubt after that. In that sense, they're more perfect than humans. Way more, okay? Way more elevated and, and great than we are in that regard. And so, what that means, though, for this, this little part right here of Colossians is that at certain points, ladies and gentlemen, in the Old Testament, and even our own life, uh, but especially before Christ came, you sin, and you get out of God's good graces, and... You're all of a sudden looking, and on the opposite side there, on the winning side, is, you know, St. Michael, St. Gabriel, St. Raphael, all the other angels and saints. And you're on the other side. You're on the wrong side. You're against the good angels. Even if you don't want to be, you know, you, you're not doing the right thing. If you're acting, if you're committing evil deeds, as St. Paul says here, doing evil deeds, you are fighting against the good angels. Because, sorry, but they can't help but be for God. You know, in a certain sense, they can't really have any sympathy for the evil you're committing. All right? Just saying, no, that is against God. No, I'm against you if you're against God. Okay? Now, Christ came to heal that, uh, you know, more or less perpetual uh, war that was between us like that. Um, but it was, it was reality. Okay? Uh, even against the good angels, we were, we were set face to face and account contrary to them. So Christ came to heal that enmity, not just on earth, but also in heaven. And look at that. In verse 22, they give you something incredible. Present you holy, blameless, and irreproachable. I mentioned this to another class earlier. You know those three adjectives are not just casual adjectives. Just not, well, they sound good together. Holy, yeah, blameless, irreproachable. That sounds nice. These are the adjectives used of Old Testament sacrifices. So this reminds us of what St. Paul's been telling us all throughout, that you yourselves are the acceptable sacrifice to God now. This whole, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit is true, and not just that, you yourself are the sacrifice. And so you can be like what the Old Testament was saying of the, you know, one-year-old goats and lambs and bullocks. Holy, blameless, and irreproachable. Not a spot on you. Okay? And then, however, St. Paul, because he's just mentioned the word holy, which is the same word as saints here, he does provide one little caveat, one little reminder. Provided that you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which has been preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now you, might, you might ask yourself, and I think rightly, why does St. Paul say, provided that you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast? Why have that little proviso? Well, most likely because he knows he's about to mention some un uncomfortable information here, thing or things that might make you a little bit nervous. So as you move on to the next page, you might look up on page 145 and say, now that's curious, one verse is going to take us pretty much down to the very bottom of the page. One verse. Chapter 1, verse 24. Well, you read that one verse, and then, as I said earlier, I think you'll understand why the church had to guard Scripture a little bit, and why it's... I tell you what, let me read it. Now I, This is verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings. There's that joy from Philippians. Okay. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of His body, that is, the church. Now, be, come on, be honest with me, guys and gals. What is lacking? Come on, does anyone understand that completely just right off the bat? Does anybody need just a little bit of explanation? I mean, do we not all need a little bit of explanation? What in the world is, is, is he talking about here? This is, whoa, that's a shocker, okay? This is why the Catholic Church is so careful about the presentation of sacred scripture and make sure that the translations are always very good and that the people teaching scripture, you know, um, know their stuff before they go around talking about it. So your outline... It gives you a long list. I'm going to start with the, the thing at the bottom first, point, or, or, or let's say uh, point B. What is lacking in, in Jesus' suffering? There's no want in the sufferings of Jesus as head, but there are sufferings to come in His body, the church, and its members. 
So the thing to note is that, again, I'm not going to give you a Greek language course here, but the word that's used here for uh, what is lacking, all right, is a word that signifies, God bless you, what is expected to come, okay? That it is, it's, it, there's an expectation there, okay? And if it's not there, someone says, well, um, there, there should be something right here, okay? That means that th this is reconfirming what our Lord said in the Synoptic Gospels that um, if you choose to follow me, take up your cross. Go ahead and, that crucifix you got from me last time, <laughs> go ahead and take up your cross. You want to follow me? It's not going to be all fun and games. The, be the Beatitudes, for goodness sake. You know, read the Beatitudes. Get ready to suffer, okay? So the, the thing to note, though, is what is lacking in Christ's sufferings this is also a reiteration of the truth of the mystical body of Christ. So we're not talking about the physical body of Christ that actually s suffered and died on the cross about 2,000 years ago. That, that's, that's over and done with. But Christ chooses to make us actual mystical members of His body, the mystical body of Christ. And so the sufferings that we go through, we can call it, According to St. Paul, sufferings in the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, not the carnal, physical body of Christ, but sufferings, nonetheless, of the body of Christ that must be undergone, that must be suffered. All right? That is, uh, Christ, in a, certain, in a certain sense of the word, is, count, is kind of waiting on us, is counting on us to suffer. You remember my body. I want you to remain a member of my body, to persevere, to remain steadfast in faith. So, embrace this suffering, embrace this cross. It may be a tricky verse to understand at first, but when you get to the bottom of it, it's beautiful. It shows you that Christ our God deigned to call us His very body. Okay, now that's the good news. The bad news is that they didn't ask me about the, the grammar beforehand, so you've got I-T apostrophe S twice in a row here that drove me nuts when I first saw it. Um, so I ignore those apostrophes up there with the it's. It should be I-T-S with no apostrophe. But other than what your grammar fascist instructor uh, has to deal with psychologically and seeing those uh, mistakes, let's just move on. So the suffering of the Christian, its origin you already know from Genesis chapter 3. Okay, you know that well, Adam's sin. The thing that we just want to bear in mind is that through Adam's sin, what he did was he embraced slavery. He made, he chose Satan to be his master instead of God. He chose slavery to Satan, sin, and as God promised in the earlier part of chapter 3, you will die the death. The day you eat that fruit, you will die the death. He chose death as a master as well. Okay? So there is that. Uh, then our personal sins, you know what they do? We continue to basically sign our names at the bottom of the, the, the form there that says, yes, I, I will be a slave as well. Our personal sins reiterate that choice of Adam. And then, uh, because we chose such a horrible master through Adam and with our own personal sins, uh, what are we expecting in return from him? Well, if Scripture is true and gives us any indication, attacks, okay? Not caresses, you know, not, uh, not a sweet little gifts, but attacks from the devil. That's what we should expect from that master, okay? Uh, all the sorts of enticements and attacks that would lead us into the seven capital vices or, or capital sins, all right? From pride to gluttony to lust to envy, you name it. Sloth, right? Not making the most of our time as we should. That's what we, that's what we opted for. It's what we chose. Now, instead, that's the suffering that came in the wake of Adam's sin. All right? so remember, St. Paul told us, all of creation has been groaning ever since then. But that suffering through Jesus can be transformed, and it is. St. Paul knows about that is conversion. Conversion, it's, I, I say it's probably the most important because it's where you say, all right, I, don't any lo I, I no longer want to be a slave under this master Satan. No longer. I don't want that anymore. I want my master to be the Lord God. I want to serve Jesus Christ. I will serve. I know Satan said I will not serve him before. In the past I've said I will not serve. I'm not, I'm not serving. Now, yes, I, I want to serve. I'm, I'm changing masters. I want to be a slave of God and not a slave of Satan. That's what conversion is. Why do I say St. Paul can tell us about this probably better than anyone else? Well, thanks to suffering, 
we have St. Paul on the team of God, okay? He saw St. Stephen be stoned and bleed to death. And what's the witness that he hears from all that? Lord, pl please don't lay this sin at their, at their feet. You know, don't, don't, don't count this against them. Praying for his persecutors as he dies, breathing his last. That's what he says right in front of St. Paul. And thankfully, uh, you know, St. Paul is transformed himself by that suffering and has a conversion, ch chooses a new master. And what does he do? Very quickly after that, after a few days spent recovering and, you know, um, getting some instruction, runs off into the desert to detach himself from all the attachments he did have to those seven cardinal sins, to the, the different attacks that the Satan had been successfully getting him to say yes to before. Now, he goes into the desert for three years and purifies, asks God for the purification from those attachments to sins and makes reparation, does penance. Okay? The beautiful thing, though, that uh, th this verse, this single verse, brings back to our minds is that there is a value to every moment of our suffering, right? So uh, you, you often talk about the, the value of suffering in regard to the, the body of Christ. I mean, it, it's true. We've talked about this in the letter to, um, especially in the letter to the Philippians. It, it helps other members of the body of Christ as we suffer and offered up willingly, gl you know, gladly, joyfully, as St. Paul says here, now I rejoice in my sufferings. But the, the beautiful thing that we, again, are reminded of here is that it can also help, um, kind of put this in quotes, potential members of the body of Christ, right? Or, uh, so, you know, I, I read your, uh, your homework, and I read everyone's homework that I get in these classes, and besides one person in this class, I was blown away and, and, and thrilled to see every single person and this is not revealing anybody, it's outing everyone, I guess you'd say, if anybody. Every single person has read that, written that, yes, I've had many family members fall away from the Catholic faith, sadly, you know, friends, so on and so forth. That, that's, that's been the hardest thing for me to do. I mean, that, that's, that's an emotional point for me as, a, as an instructor to read that and say, that's, that is horrible. You know, in the last few decades, yes, many, many fa friends, family members. The other thing to remember for all of us then is that this is for conversion, for members of the body of Christ, and even for, as we talked about in the letter to the Romans, now currently dead members. That is, those who are not, not in the state of grace right now because not practicing the faith, haven't been to confession in a long time, so on and so forth. Our sufferings benefit them as well. Okay? So any potentially revivified members of the body of Christ, of whom we know many, uh, all of us in all these classes, we benefit them by joyfully accepting our sufferings as St. Therese did. So that's, that's an encouragement for all of us, I hope. All right? uh, the other thing that your outline reminds you of is it contributes to the glory of God, conformity to Christ crucified, because we are we're saying, okay, St. Paul's told us several times now, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to imitate what Paul's doing, joyfully accept, embrace my sufferings. Christ did that. And that is going to be for the greater glory of God. Well, how do I, how do I know that? What, what's the proof of that? Look at E. It's going to lead to the propagation of the gospel. And that, remember what I told you, salvation of more souls and the greater glory of God. We talked about this last week. The Jesuit motto, you know, for the greater glory of God. And salvation of souls, they are inseparably conjoined. You can't pull them apart. So when St. Paul says in Philippians 1.12, let me just reread that for you real quick. I want you to know, brethren, this is when he's in chains, in prison, right, that uh, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brethren have been made confident in the Lord because of my imprisonment and are much more bold to speak the word of God without fear. More people are, are, are being set up to accept the gospel of Christ because they saw how St. Paul... Did. Look, he could, have did, he could have done what St. Peter did three times there around the fire, you know, watching our Lord and said, No, yeah, I, I don't know this Christ. I don't know why you're trying to put me in jail. I don't, I don't know anything about him. No, 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 no. Instead, no, he willfully and joyfully embraced it willingly, rather, and joy, joyfully embraced that suffering, and it made an impression on those around him in the household of Caesar, for goodness sakes. Incredible. Okay, any questions about that one verse that we have an almost entire page to talk about? Anything that comes to mind? Okay, 
So there's that, and then you, uh, you see that quickly St. Paul comes to, to something that's going to encourage, especially Gentiles. He says, Of which I've become a minister according to the divine office which was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Now here's why I say the Gentiles are going to be especially happy about this. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now made manifest to his saints. By the way, remember who was called a holy people, a chosen people in the Old Testament? Right? That's the Israelites. Now it's been made manifest to his saints, and that includes a lot of Gentiles. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this majesty which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, Him we proclaim, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man mature in Christ. For this I toil, striving with all the energy which He mightily inspires within me. So as your outline has for you here in point number four, what St. Paul is doing with all of this is showing the Gentiles God had you in mind all along. Okay? The promise He made to Adam and Eve who were the father and mother of all the living that promise he made in Genesis 3.15 about a serpent's head being crushed eventually, he had you guys in mind as the, bene the, uh, let's say the beneficiaries of that crushing of the serpent's head. The promises he made, as your outline says here, to Abraham he had you in mind because Abraham received those promises before he was ever circumcised, as you wrote in your homework. Um, so there's that. And uh, just the, chronologically, the fact is this... This plan of salvation was not... It was concealed. It was... Uh, it, it had some cloaks over it, as they usually do in Catholic churches around you know, this coming Sunday, start veiling the statues. You know? That's, that's really what happened to the message. That's how the message of salvation was veiled for a while in the Old Testament. What I'm saying is, if, if you took away your knowledge of the New Testament right now, all right, so hindsight's 20-20, if you take away your knowledge of the New Testament, you go back and read the Old Testament, I'm telling you, not even, you know, Scott Hahn, not even Pope Benedict can say, oh yeah, I can read the Old Testament and say, I, I, could, I could see, I could foresee easily all what's going to happen in the New Testament. No, nobody could. Not even the angels could. Okay, as brilliant as the angels are. Because, let me just give you a quick example. You, you hear the, the glorious stuff of Genesis 3.15. He's going to come and crush that dragon's head. Another interpretation of the word serpent in Genesis 3.15. Crush the dragon's head. And you read 2 Samuel 7. You think he's going to be a mighty king like David. That sounds great. Isaiah 7.14. He's going to be born of a virgin. Just incredible power. And then you read Isaiah 53. The suffering servant song. You think, okay, well, there's a lot of glorious stuff going on, but I don't know how we fit this. You know, it doesn't even look like a man beaten to a pulp. How, how do we fit that in with the other prophecies of this Messiah? So you could tell in the Old Testament, these are prophecies about a coming Savior, but how it all fits together, the particulars, God saved it for the time when the Apostle of the Gentiles is going to go and reveal it to these Gentiles. All right, so they ha th that is, the Jews have nothing on them, okay? This is something that is for all of mankind. Does that make sense? Is that... Okay. Any questions about that before we move on to point B? Or letter B? I guess. Alright. <clears throat> so then, I get to point out to you why I put heresy right here beside syncretism. Alright. Paul's condemnation of heresy. I, you Look, you, you notice, I'm going to be honest with me, you notice the outline has um, been pretty heavy-handed with the, the Protestants, right? You notice this? Lots of critiques of the different errors in Protestant theology. Okay, Why is that so important? Well, let me just make a, a, a brief statement about that. So Paul's condemnation of heresy and why I connected with syncretism. Uh, Protestants share an awful lot with us Catholics, right? We, we can cooperate on a lot of things. We agree about a, a fair amount. Um, perfectly clean water. And water with just a little bit of cyanide share a lot in common as well. Okay? Just saying. Just saying. So it's, it's, it's a truth there. The problem is, a little perversion of the true faith, of right doctrine, can kill our souls. Because, remember we said, knowledge precedes the will which precedes the action. 
Now, I'm not saying that anyone that came up, I'm not saying Luther or Calvin themselves had this in mind when they first came up with their, their new ideas that they added on to the historic Christian faith. But if you tell somebody, once you're saved, you're always saved, you can, I'm telling you, I guarantee you cannot tell me that someone at some point is not going to say, well, if I'm saved, what does it matter if, and fill in the blank, I mean, come on, we've all got a human psyche, okay? We know how the human mind works and how our wills work, and weak wills as well. So I'm just saying, this, this is the reason why your outline is, is, is careful about these potential relapses into something that basically uh, would be the equivalent of the, something you've heard before in modern culture that you probably abhor, but it is, in, in essence, what Luther and Calvin were recommending by saying, once saved, always saved. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. I, I'm okay. You're okay. Well, if I'm okay and you're okay, we're all okay. I mean, what need do we really have of any improvement? I mean, if you're okay and I'm okay, we, we're all okay. It's, it's okay. It's all okay, right? No, it's not. St. Paul makes that clear in every single one of his letters. We're not okay as we are, even if we're living the perfect... Saint, as I'll just I'll use this example to the end of the year. Saint Mother Teresa was not okay until the day she died. She just she had to keep going to confession. It's incredible. If she can, then we can. All of us can, you know. Uh, so that that's why your your outline just brings up instances to show this this is not what Christ had in mind. Not once saved, always saved. Okay, that is not that is not the Christian faith. Okay. So then, uh, Paul's refutation specifically of paganism is that um, he had to, I told you, I'm going to be fair to these folks who are saying, worship angels. I'm not going to make fun of them, okay? We are pitiful in comparison with the angels, okay? Let's just be honest, ladies and gentlemen. Let's, let's have a little bit of humility. Compare to the angels, we are pitiful. They, they want to be somewhere and they are there. Okay, they they see uh, they're presented with new information. It could be calculus four, and it's there. It's 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 done, understood completely and fully. Right, that is not how we work. Okay, and the body weighs us down. Even if we wanted to understand calculus four ASAP, uh, the body's not going to let us all in one even in one evening. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so there's that. The angels are, in and of themselves, their natures are, are superior to ours. Okay? That's why when we get to the letter to the Hebrews, when it says that He made Him, that is God, made Christ a little less than the angels. You know, what? Well, I, there's, that is, that, that form of a slave we talked about last week in the letter to the Philippians, there's a truth to that. I mean, it's compa especially compared to the angels. All right, he did indeed. It's, it's, it's a big step down, big step, and we are below the angels. However, through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, through his his crucifixion and then resurrection and ascension, he ascends above the angels in in, in the scheme of salvation, and he carries us in his train behind him. All right, he elevates us above the angels as well, then through grace. All right, because. We share flesh. We actually get to... Con the angels... Think about this, ladies and gentlemen. This is in... Any good book about the angels will remind you of this. As great as the angels are, what's the one thing the angels can never do that you can do almost every day of the year besides Good Friday and Holy Saturday? You can consume the precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus, of God Himself. Angels can't do that. So there you go. We are elevated above them, but... As it stands, in their natures, they are greater than we are, okay? So there's that. That's why it's, it's a little bit tough to grasp at first, and that's why meditation on the seven sacraments and what they do to unite us, to make us saints, you know? Meditation on the seven sacraments will let you see, okay, now I can see what God was doing. And especially a way to keep the angels humble, so to speak, is showing that He can take man and lift him up, um, and divinize man. So that's, that's what St. Paul's talking about in number one there in your outline. There's also, though, this uh, reputation of relapse to Judaism. Okay? Let me read you the, especially the, the pertinent verses here. I, I think this is really, really neat. Besides the thing about the, um, the circumcision made without hands, which is baptism, that shows this connection between the Old Testament. What's the Old Testament doing? It, look, it, it, circumcision... 
uh, was pointing to baptism, if we can call baptism the circumcision without hands, I mean circumcision is giving you kind of the theme or the type of baptism, then, well, look at verse 16, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Shadow. Now, if you've never heard of the Allegory of the Cave by Plato, add that to the list of things I'm giving you as homework tonight to look up. The Allegory of the Cave. You ever heard of it? Some? Few? Half? Maybe? Okay. Allegory of the Cave by Plato. Not Plato, but Plato. P-L-A-T-O. Plato, the Allegory of the Cave is basically um, an, an ancient equivalent of what St. Paul is saying right here. That is from about 400 B.C. He says, most of our lives, we go around and treat reality... It's as if we're looking at shadows on, a, on the wall of a cave, okay? And we don't take the time to think, what, what's really behind those shadows? What, or what is behind us? So we're seeing these shadows on the wall of the cave. You know what? That probably means there's some light back there and some actual people moving around. Right, actual substances, not the shadows themselves. Not to say, not to take away anything from the shadows. The shadows are there. There's something to the shadows, but the shadows should right, you know, turn our head. Like I, I do to my son. He's always looking. I, I sing in the choir at our church. And it's behind where he usually sits, and he's always looking back. And my dad said, "Turn, look at, look ahead at God." Okay, you know, I had to turn his head and go there. So th this is what shadows do. They turn our head to look back at the substance, Christ, the reality, the light. Okay? That is the Old Testament sacraments, or the, you know, sacramentals, things like circumcision. All the, the types you read about last year in year one, they're great, even though they're just shadows, because they're pointing you to the light, to the substance that is Christ. That's, that was their duty, and I think they do a pretty darn good job of it. Right? They, they point to you what the sacraments are going to be in the New Testament. Right? So that is the, that's their job. Uh, why is that so important? Well, because, as you see right there in point number five of your outline, we have to learn about what do, what do we have to do as baptized? How do we live our lives? Well, what St. Paul spends almost all of chapter 3 and chapter 4 doing is he tells us what specifically we need to do now. So he says, look, if, you, if you've been raised then with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And look, just what I, look, I, I spent so much time last week, it may be a little bit too much, on the whole mind connection and the senses, remember, from Philippians. But St. Paul emphasizes it here again. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Because, you know, another thing that the bad angels can do, if you've seen, you know, a movie that has something bad, impure, whatever in it, if you've heard something bad or impure, uh, even, believe it or not, with the angels, they, they like the olfactory senses a lot too. If you've even smelled something foul before, they can bring the memories of these back up to you. They, they, they can use these bad things that have come through our senses. They can use them against you again later on in your life to help you fall. That's why I say be careful what you set your mind on, what, what you allow to come through your senses. Because your senses even, your whole body has been redeemed by God. So it's, you know... It belongs to Him. Uh, so, if you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, where uh, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also appear with Him in glory. But here's what you've got to do. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. He gives you some examples. Immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, St. Paul and the entire Old Testament has been against idolatry from day one. And what does he identify as idolatry? Covetousness. I, I got to have, I need, I want, I want. It's mine, it's mine, mine. Well, you know what? That sounds an awful lot like the language of a slave owner. A master, someone who's got a lot that's his. He's mine, she's mine. Covetousness. Wanting to own something that it, you really don't need, ought not to be yours, okay? On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Slander, foul talk from your mouth, wrath, anger. That's my big one. 
at least sanguine choleric struggle there. But uh, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. And then he gives you some examples of the, the stuff you do want in verse 12. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another. Remember that word forbearance from Philippians 4? That right if he told you, rejoice in the Lord always, but suffering, forbearing one another, all right, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, even if it's a valid complaint, all right? So this is what St. Paul recommends, together, by the way, with that verse that we mentioned early on, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Just, you can't get enough, okay? Get as much as you can. As you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And then, you know what? St. Paul is kind enough to even give specific commands to wives, husbands, children, fathers, and even slaves. Okay? I mean, the, the, these other things we've heard before. Women, be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. By the way, uh, against what seems like a, a suggestion the Ignatius Study Bible, th this is not some sort of cultural norm. St. Paul says right here, as is fitting in the Lord. He doesn't say, as is fitting in first century culture. No, he says, as is fitting in the Lord. There's a hierarchy in the family. And he asks the husbands to do something even really... Uh, tougher, at least for me. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Okay, that's, that's not asking just a little. Children, you got a, four, a, a commandment named after this. Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. These are all things that are going to be good for your relationship with God, as well as with another. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. And look at verse 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, but the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly. <clears throat> Why? Knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, right here, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to get to Philemon, but right here, St. Paul lays the groundwork for letting... Remember, we just had the word mature a few verses ago? For allowing the mature Christian to draw an inference, to, to do some deduction... All right. If St. Paul's telling me this is true, this is true, this is true, looks like there's no way that licitly, as a good Christian, I could keep a slave. St. Paul's laying the foundation for it. Wait, it's, it's about to be beautiful. Wait till we get to it. The one other thing I'll mention to you, though, is that then he tells all the people there to do the actions of a slave. What particular actions? He tells them, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now, if you're a master, you know what? You don't stay up at night to look out over all your goods or have to do a particular night duties that are you know, just to be done at night. No, you go and get yourself a good night's sleep, and you have your slaves do it. Instead, St. Paul is telling all of the Christians at Colossae to stay up all night in prayer, to keep vigil. Act like a slave yourself, a slave of God. Okay, so that, that language of the slave is there. And although the RSV doesn't give it to you, the, the older, if you ever have, if you have a Douay Reims at home, you'll, you'll find this here, and you also find the old King James Version, ironically. But in verse 5, conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, redeeming the time. The, the Greek word here is the word for, re, the same word that's used about Christ's redemption. Redeem the time. Making the most of, I mean, that, okay, I mean, that, that's... Mm, that's kind of what it means, but the word is redeeming the time because before we were slothful. That's, that's the first... That, remember, that is the entrance of all seven capital sins. You're slothful. That's the devil's playground. He's coming to have a good time with you now. Sloth. That's the, that's, it seems like the most insignificant of all the seven capital sins, and yet it's the doorway, the gate for all the others, all the way up to pride, which was Satan's sin, and Adam's. So redeem the time, okay? Buy it back. 
And then the other great uh, re remarks that St. Paul makes here. Other thing you definitely want to notice about chapter 4, I, I can't believe your outline doesn't mention this, um, it's not just various salutations. Uh, guess who else? Guess who all he um, salutes or tells uh, the Colossians, uh, salutes them? St. Mark, just so happens to be an evangelist. St. Luke, another evangelist. In an earlier class, said, how does St. Paul get all this great stuff? Well, I mean, is it just a perpetual kind of uh, video stream from God, live? From that? What is going on? Is it, well, no, I mean, he's, he's hanging out with two of the synoptic evangelists in Rome. Not bad company to keep, St. Mark and St. Luke. All right, so they are there at the end of chapter 4. And um, I love this, too. The, I, I'm, I put this verse up here as well. Verse 4, 16. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. This lets you know, as part of their liturgical assemblies, they were reading sacred scripture from day one, okay? And the letters of St. Paul were considered very important in that regard. All right, that's the letter to the Colossians, but the, the perfect complement to all this is the letter to, Phi to Philemon, written to one particular person, as your outline says there, about the same time. And the only thing I'll, I'll bring up for you is that it's not just an appeal for forgiveness from Philemon for Onesimus, although it is definitely that as well. But uh, your outline, look at 2A on page 147. St. Paul says, I could demand you forgive Onesimus, but appeal instead. So I, I, well, in fact, let me just read the verse itself to you. Um, yeah, so let's just read it the way it's written here. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. Wait a minute, he just said, what is required? St. Paul just said, what is required? He, I'm telling you, what he's doing is laying the theological framework so that Philemon, an intelligent man, can say, Ooh, A is true, B is true, C is true, therefore, uh, D. Hmm. I can't keep slaves anymore. That's not fitting with my Christian vocation, really, when it comes down to it. I'm really obliged and required otherwise, to act otherwise. Now, not just that. This is what I want to leave you with. I think it's the most beautiful thing of the entire night is this right here. St. Paul says right before that in verse 7, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, <clears throat> my brother. Okay, now Philemon and Paul are, part, are members of the same immediate family. My brother. And comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Now, hearts of the saints have been refreshed. Where does that phrase also come up in sacred scripture? Your, your insides, are, something special happens to your insides. First, well, the, the most significant time this comes up in the Old Testament is when Solomon makes the first display of God's wisdom. Remember what he, God said, you may choose anything from me. Solomon chooses wisdom. The first trial of his wisdom is when two women come up, one of whom has slept, unfortunately, on her baby and you know suffocated the baby to death. They come up arguing over this baby. What do you do? What do you do? Well, Solomon asks for a big long sword to cut the baby in half and give half to one woman and half to the other. The actual mother, the family member of this child, what does she do? No, 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 no. Just, 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 just give the baby to her. Give it to her. Give it to her. Give it to her. her. And it says in sacred scripture that her insides are moved. All right? The same word that's used here for heart. Uh, so what, what's happening is that St. Paul is suggesting to Philemon, who probably knows his Old Testament Scripture very well, you, you, my heart's kind of stirred up right now. I want you to calm it down. So uh, not just that, but he says, look, I, Paul, an ambassador. Actually, the word here in verse 9 for I, Paul, an ambassador, you have this little mark in your RSV. The, the word is actually an old man. I'm an old man. I ain't having any more kids, okay? I'm too old to have any more kids. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner, I can't even get out of prison for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child. This is my child. Just like the lady there in front of Solomon. Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you. As his name means useful, made use of him. But formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very insides, my heart, you, you, you're gonna, legally, according to Roman law, you, you could kill him. Capital punishment. It's, it's very, very illicit. He, not only did he steal from me, he ran away from me. Capital punishment. Normal punishment for that crime in ancient Rome. This is my very heart. What, what are you going to do with my very heart? He's a brother, fellow brother in Christ, fellow heir to the kingdom of our common Father in heaven. 
Here's my heart. What are you going to do with it? St. Paul, I think, you know what he does as well? He, he doesn't, he, he's not throwing a bunch of things at you preaching. He's, he's laying it on the line here. He's giving you also the emotions that are attached with all these theological truths and saying, what ought to be done? He's not telling you what ought to be done. He's, he's giving you the basis to draw the logical and theological conclusion yourself as a mature Christian. So did, did St. Paul do enough to combat this slavery that's an invention of a sinful man, as your outline says? I would say yes. Not only that, uh, not only does he give you what he has here in Philemon, but uh, the idea of the Jubilee comes through in every one of St. Paul's letters and is there in the Acts of the Apostles, written by his buddy, whom he was talking to in Rome, Luke, St. Luke the Evangelist. Okay. Um, yeah, so those are the letters to the Christian community at uh, Colossae and to the man Philemon, who was an influential layman. All right, so, uh, I look forward to seeing you all next week. If you have any questions, feel free to come up afterward and be around. Um, next week's our last week for two weeks, so look forward to seeing you then. All right, men of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Isidore of Seville, pray for us. And all you holy saints and angels, pray for us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.